Um, we, this we are, meeting is being recorded. <laughs> we are recording this meeting. Um, please ensure your microphone is muted and your video is off. For uh, That's more for, for panellists than, than attendees because that's automatically turned off. There is a Slido opportunity for Q&A. Please take a moment to uh, either QR code that with your camera on your phone or go to slido.com and enter the code hashtag global tech. And then Lauren will get those questions and she'll then moderate questions and answers to the fantastic speakers we've got today. Um, if you don't wish to be recorded, um, uh, obviously uh, as an attendee, you, you're more of an observer than, than, than an partic active participant, but the information will be provided in relation to this recording will be made available on Austrade and other YouTube channels. So if you miss out, you want to share this fantastic uh, webinar, you'll be able to do so by going to the Austrade uh, YouTube channel. With that in mind, I'd love to introduce you to David Kamalengo from Austrade and introduce the fantastic program we have today. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Um, and uh, I too actually like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands of which I'm joining from. And I'm in uh, Southwest Brisbane, so this is Yagara country and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, thank you, Simon, and thanks everybody for joining this global tech webinar on Indonesia. Just as a bit of background, this global tech webinar series uh, is a partnership between Austrade and AIIA to deliver a series of 10 webinars each, essentially highlighting a different country. And the purpose is really to highlight opportunities for Australian tech companies in overseas markets, particularly in markets where they may be less familiar with the market itself. And so the first 10 webinars have a focus on Southeast Asia and then um, slowly moving up into Northeast Asia as well. But today's webinar is focused on Indonesia um, with you know, a very rapidly growing digital economy that's projected to exceed 124 billion by the end of 2025 and fast booming digital consumers powered by increasing internet penetration, exponential growth in e-commerce, really excited. Um, to hear a bit about the content today. You will hear in today's session a little about the current digital landscape, um, including the challenges and opportunities in Indonesia, a snapshot of Indonesia's regulatory and policy agenda, and practical ways to enter the market, um, and hearing from some of the success stories. So we hope that you'll find the information useful as you explore potential new overseas markets for your business. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Lauren Adams, who is Austrade's Deputy Consul General and Trade Investment Commissioner based in Indonesia. Over to you, Lauren, to lead the session. Thanks, David. And for those joining from Australia, good afternoon. For those who are in Indonesia with me, good morning. And thank you for joining today's Global Tech Webinar on Indonesia. As David mentioned, and for those who don't already know me, I'm our the Australian Trade Commissioner based in Indonesia, responsible for our commercial engagement in the technology sector. Thank you to AIIA for hosting today's event together with Austrade. The objective of today's session is to provide each of our participants with an update on the digital technology sector in Indonesia, the growth drivers and opportunities, the challenges, and the often considered challenging regulatory environment, but importantly, how it has evolved in recent years and implications for business in the sector and the opportunities that it presents. And lastly, some insights from two Australian founded companies, Proofteck and Astronaut, who are successfully operating in the Indonesian market. We're fortunate to be joined for today's session by our good friends at Ernest & Young's Indonesia technology team and leading local law firm Asagaf Hamza and Partners. Thank you also to Danny Cohen, co-founder and CEO of Proofteck, and Nigel Hembrow, the founder and CEO of Astronaut, for taking the time to join us today. Charlotte, if you could go to my slide, please. Thank you. Not to labor the point, and David's mentioned some of these already, but I'd like to take a few minutes to set the scene for our discussion and provide a brief snapshot about why, and as an Australian technology company, you should be considering Indonesia. Our friends at EY and Ahape will then dig into these a bit more. You'll see a bunch of numbers on the slide. Many of you are deeply familiar with these. Population of 278 million, expanding middle class, and mass smartphone usage. 
these factors have underpinned a digital economy that grew by 49% year on year in 2021 alone, and is expected to continue to grow to 146 billion US dollars by 2025, an upgrade from the number that David just mentioned now, a recent one. The largest e-commerce market in ASEAN, with total sales of 53 billion US dollars last year, an increase of 52% year on year. Interestingly, Indonesia also represented 26% of all fintech investment in Southeast Asia in 2021. This is equal to additional investment of 840 million US dollars in the Indonesian fintech sector since 2017. And all of these factors have been accelerated by the pandemic. There's other drivers, growing financial literacy, government investment in internet connectivity, digitalization of various sectors, and the government transition to cloud first and e-government. But there's no denying that Indonesia can be a complex market. The technology space is no exception. In recent years, I've observed numerous efforts to establish an improved regulatory framework to unlock technology adoption and digitalization. Examples include removal of mandatory data localization for the private sector, some liberalization around the use of third party technology in the financial services and banking sectors, and notably, the recent passage of Indonesia's personal data privacy law by the House of Representatives. Still needs a sign off from the president. We've got a few more weeks left. But like with any other market, you need to keep your finger on the pulse. Hence the importance of sessions like today and bringing together industry representatives and experts in their field who are based in market and can brief you and provide insights that you might not otherwise be aware of. So with that, I would like to invite our first group of speakers from Ernest & Young Indonesia, Pak Anugra Pratama, Partner Strategy and Transactions, and Pak Heri Atmaja, the lead for ASEAN Digital and Emerging Technology, to talk to you about opportunities in the Indonesian digital technology sector. Over to you, Pak, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, Lauren. Uh, may I share screen? Okay, let me share screen. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Loren. So, uh, good morning for those of you who joined from uh, Indonesia, and good afternoon for those of you who joined from uh, Australia. So, I'll be accompanied by my colleagues here, Pak Heri Atmaja who is the leader uh, in ASEAN Digital and Emerging Technology from Ernst Young to walk you through uh, the potential, the uniqueness of Indonesia so that you'll be uh, getting more excited to, to invest and uh, do business in this country. Yeah. So we, when we talk about Indonesia, this is it. This, this is the country that will definitely grow in the future will become one of the largest economy in at least Southeast Asia. And if you talk to many think tanks, uh, World Bank, ADB, you name it, uh, everyone will have a very positive outlook on Indonesia. Uh, if we summarize, most of them will put Indonesia in a, a much better position. So, uh, very promising in terms of economic uh, growth. Everyone believe it's very easy for Indonesia to be in the uh, number eight of the largest economy uh, globally. So easily two and a half times uh, within uh, uh, in the size of the economy uh, within the uh, 20 years uh, down the road. So from 2020 to 2040. Uh, it's a very unique country and we do have what we call a demographic bonus, which is not uh, something that not all countries in the world uh, have it uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So what is actually the a demographic bonus is uh, the productive age, a number of population of productive age, working population are basically much higher than non-productive age. 
this is very important if you see it from the market point of view because productive age 15 to 64 are those who will have a spending power those who are actually digital native going forward those who are actually willing to explore willing to try new things willing uh, are, are more receptive to technology than any other uh, age uh, brackets going forward so already is a is already a, a big customer base uh, going forward the other uniqueness of indonesia is many people think that the economy is driven mostly by corporation but in fact it's micro small medium enterprise based uh, economy yeah. and this we will talk about it a little bit later that this uh, segment is actually uh, provide a huge opportunity and still untapped by many uh, players within the sectors not to mention of what ibu lawrence uh, mentioned it really depends on who you talk to uh, i don't really care on the numbers but it, it's actually a positive number so yeah e-commerce transaction internet penetration yeah a gdp contribution from the ict communication easily five percent of the uh, of the economy but what i want to highlight here is uh, learning from the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic, so it's a blessing in disguise for, for, for Indonesian market. So people are more accustomed to do transactions online. People are more comfortable doing financial transactions using uh, ICT platform, tax uh, platform, and so on and so forth. Growing mobile internet penetration, stronger infrastructure, our government is trying hard to roll out uh, capacity as well as the coverage uh, to increase uh, outreach to more of, and more of our population. This is what we call uh, the uniqueness of Indonesia. So only one word to, to actually describe the segment. Under segment, underserved, underdeveloped, unconnected if you're talking about consumer market demand so underserved indonesia is a very huge country we still see a gap between regions say western part of indonesia versus uh, eastern part of indonesia then we will have for example gap of uh, megapolitan versus rural area yeah high and low penetrated segment a gap of uh, technology acumen between uh, corporations and micro, small, medium enterprise. When we talk about underdeveloped, there are still some segment, potential segments on uh, that need to be touched, that need to be educated on the digital literacy, financial literacy. If you talk about second tier, third tier city, there's still a lot of homework on this digital literacy, financial literacy. In terms of unconnected, uh, even the industry players, they were still facing problems uh, in terms of funding. Even the customer corporation will have limited access to knowledge on how to utilize technology, yeah, as well as limited access to products uh, availability. In terms of industry players, we also see some kind of a market inefficiency. So you pick any segments, you pick any industry in Indonesia, you will find out a lot of inefficiency that can be uh, helped with the solution from ICT. Pick, for example, logistic and speed of service. You can pick manufacturing, yeah. high cost of operations, market access, market intelligence, all of these things can be actually uh, facilitated by uh, ICT solutions. Uh, another interesting uh, facts, or, or rather, uh, a proof that you pick any industry in Indonesia and you'll find a potential soon to be unicorn. You, you can pick agri that we have a champion in agri tech. You pick education. You you we have champion in edu tech. Financial service, we have champion in sure tech, health tech, and so on and so forth. 
fintech not not to mention fintech and e-commerce so uh, this is a, a showcase actually that uh, indonesia is a is a place and a lot of inefficiency that can be so, uh, solved by uh, ict as well as the tech startup another interesting fact is actually if you look at the very large customer base diverse uh, needs of Indonesia. Indonesia can be a good what's called training ground for your business. So if you set up the business from Australia coming here, you set up the business, you learn about the, the customers, you learn to serve how uh, different type of segments, Yeah, it will create a kind of a urge on innovation. For example, how to serve the underserved market, how to increase the outreach, how to to provide services with the affordable pricing. What kind of a new business model? It will trigger your innovation. And it's actually proven. Some of uh, investment in Indonesia, some of the Indonesia-based companies are now becoming regional champion. We can see Gojek, for example. Now Gojek is not only big in Indonesia, but also one of the largest in terms uh, of digital uh, ecosystem in the region in ASEAN. Let's look at the Metro Data, the ICT distributor and reseller in Indonesia, using the Indonesia as a training ground and then expand into uh, the region. So a lot of opportunities uh, is a perfect training ground for, for everyone. And I think I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleagues, Pa Harry, uh, to run you through on uh, the ICT, potential ICT solutions. Over to you, Pak Harry. Thank you, Pak Anuk. Uh, thank you, Bapak-Bapak, uh, Bapak, Ibu, everyone uh, in Australia. On the message from Pak Anuk is that I think uh, Indonesia as a country is actually quite fine to actually undergo a lot of basically uh, uh, transformations. Uh, with that, uh, we have seen, uh, as Pak Anuk has shared, right, how a lot of the uh, basically tech-based players have actually emerged in the past four or five years. And then, as you said, uh, the KPIs, we have seen at least a couple of data cons, and we have seen quite a number of unicorns. Uh, so uh, if I were, uh, if I, I place myself in these shoes, right, and looking at Indonesia as a potential market, right, well, where should I start, basically? Let me start by sharing a bit of generic slide saying that when you're talking about a client or company, uh, as we are looking at uh, the client, uh, because you are a professional services as well, then there are basically about like five domains that you can see where technology is actually infused within the company. So this diagram is a very simplification of that. Uh, for, for one, uh, in the older days, we have seen basically solutions such as SAP, ERP, HR systems. Uh, I would basically categorize them as basically an enterprise ERP and backend operation kind of system. As you can see, it's actually towards the bottom based on the, the pyramid itself, right? Uh, the second one is that I think what we have seen, uh, a lot of uh, changes in terms of the creativity around innovation is actually uh, the layer above it, which is actually the front end and the product and service development. In the past, at least during my older days, when talking about product, is something that's tangible. But right now, moving forward, I mean, a market the size of uh, Indonesia, 270, 280 million, then we're talking about mass markets, right? Then, digital product becomes very much a way to reach out to those uh, uh, large pool of basically segment. Uh, products become basically digital or digitalized, right? Some of the things that we have seen, uh, e-money, e-wallet, for example, marketplace, it has really actually ignited the, uh, uh, the, the baseline economies of Indonesia. And then I think it continues to process my uh, Anu Kashya. And when we're talking about this enormous growth, right? Uh, from technology perspective, uh, you, you can't run away from having actually a strengthened uh, uh, fortified cyber layer, hence the layer above it, the cyber security. And uh, on the right hand side, we're talking about technology based, infrastructure based kind of solutions. We cannot also run away from having an infrastructure. And then, funny enough, given the, I think the geographical and uh, regulatory nature of Indonesia, it's still a combined infrastructure. So there's still a lot of heavy on premise kind of investment specifically in the financial sector because of the uh, push from the legal regulator to have the data actually on, uh, resided onshore. But we have seen actually a lot of uh, growth and boost in terms of using the cloud infrastructures. Uh, 
proven by uh, the, the, the local zones that have been actually uh, committed by uh, GCP, AWS, and I think Microsoft is also, Azure is also coming into the uh, picture as well soon enough. Now, all of those infrastructure is actually uh, cyber to protect front end and the back end to actually capture data, consumer and then your own enterprise. Ultimately, it's actually to, to, to capture, harness, and then uh, the data itself, hence the left hand side. So, roughly, this is where I think uh, the entire uh, client uh, IT or technology ecosystem would be, basically. I would not go through one by one each of those examples, uh, uh, solutions, or, for example, areas of concerns. If uh, you can move to the next slide. No, oh, sorry, one, one more point on this one. Uh, my apology. Back to the previous one. You're looking about digital transformations, right? Uh, we have tried to kind of highlight that right? when talking about digital transformations, typically it happens a lot more in the area that's actually shaded in uh, lighter blue, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So if your company is actually focusing on certain types of uh, solutions, technology innovations, especially on transformation on the digital side, look out on those uh, lighter blue uh, shaded uh, sections. Move on to the next one. I'll try to speed up a bit. Uh, Apology, this one is not as colorful, but I think yeah, if you look at this, uh, among of the different fine domains, you can see some of the uh, local players in Indonesia, right? Uh, they are by no means exhaustive, but I think it would be a good starting point for you to actually do your own kind of like Google desktop research and try to understand the kind of uh, products and services they actually uh, provide. And then if you are thinking about actually helping the uh, digital evolution or revolution to grow in Indonesia, I think uh, historically, I mean, at least in my personal experience, uh, one of the best ways to go into the market is actually by partnering with the local uh, players in the nation because there is that uh, what we call karifan lokal. Uh, it's, it's and I think uh, roughly translated into uh, local wisdom. Uh, so, so that 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 will be I think uh, kind of like the free advice from Anuk and myself uh, from Bono from you might, uh, for you if you want to, to actually go into the Indonesian market. But again, the growth is tremendous, right? Uh, challenges is actually it's not lacking in that aspect as well. Infrastructure would be for, uh, for one of the most significant ones. But hey, challenges actually breeds innovation. This is where Indonesia is at right now. And then economy-wise, and then the support, the stability of the political uh, condition is actually has been uh, one of the highest in, in, in recent years. I think Bu Lauren can probably attest to that being in Indonesia for a number of years, right? So it is an exciting opportunity. And I think I uh, leave it at this and pass to Pandu. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pak Harry. So uh, it just happened that our uh, country managing uh, uh, director, Pak David Rimbo, uh, also here. So uh, I will pass uh, a one minute uh, so so that uh, he can deliver one minute of a message uh, to everyone. Hey, hi, good morning, everyone. Just just one minute, it be very quick. Um, I just want to share one thing in terms of the the level of connectivity that we have with the with the Australian side. In terms of um, the digital, basically, um, you know, ecosystem, digital business development in Asia. So, I about a month ago, I spoke with Rebecca Hall. Rebecca Hall is the um, Southeast Asia Commissioner for the Victorian Government. She expressed basically also the serious interest and the increasing interest of the the Australian uh, tech startup ecosystem in terms of you know uh, targeting in Asia. I, I think is if, if 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 I may say you know being somebody who who divide my time half and half between Sydney and and and, and Jakarta, it is long overdue. About three years ago, at the advent of of of, 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 of BNPL, you know, at the time, you know, uh, <clears throat> we have Zip coming in after after pay, etc. We already developed the thesis that Indonesia is actually the perfect, basically, a market for for Australian, basically, BNPL players. You know, we're talking about all of the tension with China. You know, losing you know accessibility to about 1.1 billion, you know, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, market. We're talking about Southeast, Southeast Asia offering, you know, maybe not 1.1 million, but 600 million combined. And Indonesia is a perfect, basically, launching pad. If you look at basically what, um, you know, uh, Harry as well as uh, Anugrah has mentioned, you know, have already, you know, shared uh, earlier about basically how ready we are. First of all, we have basically a roadmap. EY developed basically the e-commerce roadmap for Indonesia which was ratified into a presidential decree, presidential decree number 74, year 2017. You can actually Google it up. It lays down uh, all of the pillars to be built, et cetera, from um, you know, the software coding side, you know, human development, investment, funding, all the way to infrastructure development. So, so this is a country that is so committed 
towards basically ensuring that digital basically business thrives in this country and helps basically disrupt basically what are currently imperfect you know all of the under we call it under finance under bank under insured under underserved everything secondly if you look at it the evolution of indonesian tech startups have, is already at that level where we are no longer talking about just becoming a, basically a unicorn we are talking about our unicorns now preparing and some of them have become bigger cons and they are preparing to become super apps of the region so if you look at you know you know gojek merging with um, tokopedia to, to form goto is a super app that is currently already being used primarily in indonesia but you know branching out to singapore into thailand etc and that sort of thing so let me close there what, what i'm trying to say is this is something that is long overdue so we'll be very happy to see more activities more initiatives coming from the australian app thank you <clears throat> Thank you, Pat David, and I definitely share your enthusiasm uh, and sentiments shared just now. And thank you to Pat Harry and Pat Anugra. Um, I think you could have used the whole hour on this webinar to get through the, the depth and breadth of knowledge that EY have in this sector. So thank you for, for sharing with us today. Just a reminder, we'll do Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please put your questions into Slido, hashtag global tech, um, and we'll get to those at the end. So for now, I'd like to introduce Pat Muhammad Iksan Siri, partner of Asagaf Hamza and Partners to provide the regulatory update. Over to you, Pat Iksan. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Uh, good good day, everyone. Um, so allow me to share my slide. Um, hopefully, uh, the participants can can see the slide now. Um, okay. It's dark for me. Okay. Okay. It's up now. Yeah. Okay. So thank you again, everyone, for. Uh, participating in this uh, global tech webinar. Um, I hope you're all doing well. It's a pleasure to be here and, and, and share the current tech regulatory environment in Indonesia. Just one tiny disclaimer before I start. Uh, so this presentation should not be considered uh, as a legal advice and exhaustive. And specific Indonesian legal advice uh, should always be sought uh, before setting up uh, and running a business in Indonesia. So, so with that uh, out of the way, please allow me to start the brief uh, presentation. So I believe the, uh, the previous speakers have explained why Indonesia is an attractive destination for tech investors and companies. Uh, in this session, I will go, go over briefly about the legal system of Indonesia. So unlike Australia, which has a common law system, which is based on the English legal system, Indonesia adopts a civil law system. Uh, so this means we, re we rely a lot on written constitutions or codified laws as opposed to judicial decisions. Um, as a result, there are so many laws and regulations uh, that exist in Indonesia. And unfortunately, um, so many of these laws and regulations are inconsistent and, and overlap with, with uh, one another. Uh, in terms of the regulators, the central government uh, has primary responsibility for uh, most strategic matters uh, from defense, finance, uh, taxation, uh, including ICT. Uh, while there are also regional governments who are responsible for uh, secondary non-strategic matters, uh, which uh, 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 involves uh, their, their, their areas or their jurisdictions. Now, in the central government, uh, different laws are monitored by different authorities. Uh, for example, the banking and financial services, including fintechs, are monitored by uh, the OJK or Indonesia's Financial Services Authority. Crypto assets trading is monitored by the Futures Commodity Exchange uh, Agency. And payment remittance services, including e-wallets and e-money, are under the supervision of the Central Bank of Indonesia. So when operating a business in Indonesia, one will need to take it into account all these jungle of laws and regulations and also deal with uh, numerous authorities if their business are cross-sectoral. Um, operating in Indonesia traditionally uh, requires one to have a, a place uh, in place a subsidiary company. Uh, this will mean that one will need uh, to establish uh, the so-called foreign direct investment limited liability company or uh, uh, in short called the PMA company. Uh, however, this is generally not the case for overseas uh, tech companies. There are generally no local presence requirements for overseas tech companies uh, to provide or make available their services to users in Indonesia. Uh, most overseas tech companies, they service the Indonesian market 
uh, uh, remotely uh, only after some time uh, they, 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 they have onshore operations. So on that note, I would like to still remind uh, you know overseas tech companies uh, who are servicing in the Indonesian market to still be cautious when offering their services to uh, uh, Indonesia remotely. Uh, primarily because um, uh, there are some laws in Indonesia that have extraterritorial applications. Uh, so the electronic and information uh, transactions law uh, is one of those laws. Uh, so, so this law, the EIT law, is basically the law that, that regulates digital businesses. Um, uh, that This law and its implementing regulations cover a broad range of uh, compliance requirements for digital businesses from system security, data protections, content moderation to uh, registration obligations with the ministry. Uh, so if you've heard of, um, um, uh, uh, if you've um, heard of the, the recent news uh, back in July, 2022, uh, there's been a, a public scrutiny to the Indonesian government because the Ministry of Communication um, required all digital businesses to be registered with the ministry and uh, failing to comply with that registration obligation would, you know, uh, would, would uh, lead to uh, blocking of their services. And as a matter of fact, uh, some of uh, you know big tech companies such as PayPal, Yahoo, and several online gaming providers had their services blocked uh, temporarily because they failed to register on time. Um, another Indonesian legislation that is relevant to uh, 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 you know digital businesses and has extraterritorial extraterritorial applications is the e-commerce regulation. Uh, so uh, this applies to both domestic and and uh, uh, overseas businesses that provide uh, uh, sale of goods and services through electronic system or online platform. Uh, this also includes to those who facilitate the sale and purchase of, of, of goods and services. So um, uh, companies such as e-commerce marketplaces, Amazon, uh, AliExpress.com, Rakuten, and the likes, as well as online travel uh, agent platforms such as Booking.com or Agoda, they would fall under the category of e-commerce provider under this, under this regulation. And uh, unlike uh, unlike the uh, the previous law, uh, so the e-commerce regulation has uh, do do have regulation on uh, local present requirements. Uh, so for e-commerce overseas e-commerce providers who meet uh, uh, the annual sales and uh, shipment uh, threshold, they will need to set up a, a local representative office in Indonesia. Um, alternative to operating remotely, uh, one may, may may also set up uh, businesses operation in Indonesia uh, by way of you know setting up the PMA company that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but please do note that uh, when going full uh, set up in Indonesia, that means you will need to be subject to and you will be exposed to a host of legal requirements, including licensing, uh, corporate governance, meaning that you will need to have uh, certain resident board members in Indonesia. Uh, you will need to fulfill minimum capital requirements. Uh, generally, the minimum uh, capital requirement for uh, a PMA company is around uh, Australian uh, one million Australian dollars, uh, and that will need to be uh, injected at the corporation. Uh, but for certain other uh, type of tech businesses such as fintech, uh, peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, the, the the minimum capital is as higher, which is around Australian uh, dollar two point five uh, million. Uh, and in some cases also, um, uh, there are also foreign shareholding uh, restrictions. So so you may need to look for a local JV partner uh, in such case. Now maybe my last slide. I'd like to, you know, um, highlight a little bit about what Lauren had mentioned in the in the beginning uh, of our presentation. Uh, Indonesia recently uh, approved uh, a bill on personal data protection. So uh, in 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 the not uh, um, uh, so long future, we will be having our uh, comprehensive personal data protection law, uh, which is uh, 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 very similar to to the European. Uh, union uh, style of uh, uh, data protection legislation, which is the GDPR. Uh, so this legislation will be um, uh, will be uh, the, the umbrella will be the umbrella legislation uh, on data uh, protection matters. Uh, it includes uh, a host of uh, uh, requirements, including um, uh, 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 um, a very strict uh, data users obligations. For example, they will need to respond to certain data subject requests. Uh, within uh, a very uh, specific and very short amount of time, and 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 also uh, ultimately it also has a, a very strict sanctions for those who uh, use data uh, uh, illegally. Uh, not only administrative sanctions, but also 
uh, there are criminal implications uh, for using data uh, unlawfully. So with that, probably I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, Lauren. Uh, thank you all for the um, uh, attention. Thank you, Pat Iksan. That was an incredibly uh, impressive summary of what is not a simple regulatory environment. So thank you so much. So now we're moving on to um, our fireside chat. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Danny Cohen, the co-founder and CEO of Prooftech, and Nigel Hembrow, founder and CEO of Astronaut. So rather than me introduce each of these companies individually, I thought I'd hand it over to each of you. So maybe starting with Nigel and over to Danny, tell us a little bit about your company and what the market challenge your, in, your technology is looking to address in Indonesia. Who's first? You are. <laughs> oh, me, sorry. Cool, cool, cool. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> that's right. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, and uh, it was really great, great to get the intro um, from the, the guys at Ernst & Young and also from uh, Park Fik San. Um, um, uh, for for you know, business execs and, and founders, we often uh, have our head down in the weeds, um, operationalizing everything um, that we don't get a chance to step back and really see, you know, what is the, the big picture. Uh, so it's really good um, to see that uh, for, from our speakers earlier. Um, so I'm, I'm Nigel. Um, Astronaut is a business um, based in Indonesia, however, founded by myself, an Australian. Um, uh, and uh, invested in um, um, uh, from investors here in Australia. We focus on human capital. We're a talent assessment platform used by employers um, uh, and also universities uh, for assessing, testing, verifying, um, and essentially making the whole uh, recruitment process uh, and other recruit processes uh, much faster and more data-driven. Um, um, what we're really solving on an ecosystem level is uh, information asymmetry in the talent world. Um, um, for example, uh, why do we have probationary periods, right? Um, um, if we were very confident about all of our decisions in the world of talent, we wouldn't need things like probation periods, right? There's so many legacy problems that exist in the world of uh, recruitment and talent um, simply because there's just no data um, yet. So, um, so we solve that problem. Um, we're a SaaS business, software as a service. Um, we also have an API product, um, so operate um, as a platform, as a service, and we are launching our uh, Q, in Q4, we're launching our, our graduate students marketplace business. Um, as you heard earlier, there's lots of opportunities for business model innovation um, in Indonesia. That's my quick summary. Thank you, Nigel. Danny, over to you. Sure. So I, I work on the opposite end of the spectrum with, with algorithms, algorithms and cameras as opposed to human capital. Um, but I'm uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Prooftech, and we're an Australian vision AI technology startup, and we've developed a proprietary AI asset surface inspection technology. And to decode that, it, essentially we're, we're experts in the space of finding very small anomalies or variations on the surfaces of high value assets, and being able to importantly track the change or deterioration um, in those changes. Our focus to date has been on, on anomalies in vehicles. So primarily that's being finding damages, small damages on externals of vehicles. But now we're actively looking at diversifying into other asset classes, including fixed infrastructure, telco towers, um, satellites, et cetera, and then also into the property space. So we are we are a small team, but we're a, a team of highly skilled computer vision experts. And all of our core technical team was previously working at Canon's overseas R&D lab in Sydney. We've got staff in Australia, um, as, well as, as well as London, and actively exploring opportunities to put people on the ground in our core um, Southeast Asian awesome. markets. So in terms of what we do in Indonesia, um, our technology is mainly at this stage in Indonesia helping insurers optimize their claims process in, in a number of different ways. Um, firstly, in, through the motor vehicle insurance application process. So the customers use our proprietary live image guidance to help take images of the vehicle. And then our artificial intelligence then provides the results to support their underwriting. Secondly, at the time of an incident or claim, being able to reduce the occurrence of fraud identifying any damage that was actually predated the claim and then finally by pricing the repairs 
to optimize the customer experience and claim cycle time. Uh, we, we, we're a software as a service business as well. Um, and, um, as, and additionally also have um, APIs and very comfortable in integrating into much larger third party, third party um, softwares. So we're actively exploring opportunities in, in Indonesia um, to help service the vehicle mobility space more broadly as well as including car rental, car subscription, fleet, last mile delivery, et cetera. So that's, that's a, a snapshot from me as well. Thanks, Danny. I, I'm just conscious we're probably running a bit short on time. So I'm going to combine a few questions here. Um, but maybe, uh, Danny, do you want to tell us a bit about why you chose to scale your business in Indonesia? Nigel referenced it earlier. And then talk about some of the challenges that you faced entering the market and how you overcame them. And then uh, I'll go to yeah, Nigel sure. for the next one. Yeah, sure. So they, um, so a lot of the, the key data points have been touched on by previous um, speakers. So I'll, I'll I'll go through um, relatively quickly, but from a from our perspective, um, the insurance penetration rate is a key metric. And if we look at Indonesia, the non-life insurance penetration rate for Indonesia was just 0.4%. And if you compare that to Singapore, um, 2%, Malaysia, 1.5%, and the OECD average of 4.9%, you can see there's significant room for growth there. When you look at the insurance market, the, um, second to India, Indonesia is the fastest growing property and casualty insurance market by premium. And then finally for us, um, and I'll merge these because I'm, con I'm conscious of time as well. Um, there's been numerous studies which have been held, which have been done in Indonesia, um, which have shown that, um, have said that you know, complicated registration, ineffective claims processing and high premiums are the greatest problems for Indonesians considering purchasing insurance coverage. And our platform can address many of those. So touching on, in addition to those, all of the population, the strong population growth metrics and the number of vehicles, it gives us a great opportunity um, to grow the business in Indonesia. When we look at some of the challenges, Lauren, the, um, the usual suspects tend to, tend to arise. So at times, language and cultural differences um, can very much slow down processes, um, which you know, us founders have got a, a bad habit of hoping things were done yesterday. Um, so that's mm -hmm. even not even taken into account slower processes. Um, I guess the key for us is being, um, yeah, being very patient, allowing, you know, allowing multiple meetings to cover or similar topics, uh, and then always being respectful of, of the differences. Um, another key point for us is allowing time for yeah, a mixed bilingual engagement. So a mix of engagement in English as well as Bahasa. And that gives time for, for everyone to ensure that we're on the same page. Um, and then I'll touch on one other more, that one other one, um, you know, being able to, to develop relationships during COVID was difficult. Um, but I, I think we've um, challenged a, a, a typical norm, which I've heard many times was, you know, that it's critical that face-to-face -face discussions need to be had in order to build effective long-term relationships. Um, I, I completely agree that the personal interaction is critical, um, but it hasn't been um, a det it hasn't been a defining moment for us in terms of being able to build mm -hmm. um, our client relationships there and an impediment to building some really strong relationships. Um, I've, I've got, um, so in our largest customer in Indonesia, I actually haven't met them in person, um, given, given COVID, um, but it was, you know, hope, lucky enough that they were really engaged with us, um, and gave us significant opportunity to, to build that virtual relationship. Um, but I am coming to the region, um, later this year, um, to, to meet all of our customers face to face. Uh, that's and we're probably... very much looking forward to that to having you in country uh danny later in the year and i think that's very sage advice i mean we've spoken about it previously it's about nurturing relationships whether that's uh, in person in market or, or virtually but there's always some value to meeting in person at some point so um nigel what about for you uh what are some of the things that surprised you most when you started in indonesia oh 
Nothing really surprised me. I think it's a market where you have to just get back to basics, really. Um, you can't assume um, that um, just because you've got the market right in one market, you know, that, that it's going to work in Indonesia. Um, um, so if you get right back to basics, things like product market fit, you know, pricing strategy, um, understanding who your competitors are or your alternatives, um, um, really getting all of those nailed down before you think about scaling. Yeah, so really working with one or two customers, um, understanding their needs, getting to know them well. I, I, would, I think Danny's answer was, was spot on, um, particularly being able to emphasize the fact that you don't actually need to meet in person. Yeah, um, um, but you need to know how to use WhatsApp, for example. You can build relationships with people digitally. Um, businesses like Airbnb and Tinder have proven this uh, for a long time ago, right? Um, um, you can build trust with people without needing to meet them face-to-face -face, uh, in person, uh, but you do need to spend the time, you do need to be available, um, and you do need to be responsive and you do need to be authentic. Um, and so those things are really, really important. Um, and it means you can move fast. Of course, you know, being on the ground absolutely helps um, um, because you can go deeper as well. Uh, but um, it, I think, you know, I've been, you know, we've been really blessed with Astronaut to build, you know, I've chosen this background intentionally um, um, from our screenshot from our all hands this morning. Um, you know, we are, you know, I'm really blessed to have, you know, a, a great group of people uh, that, um, that, that work, you know, um, work together with us growing the business. And I think that's another reason why we, we decided to build the business in Indonesia. Um, our operations are all there. Um, um, so, you know, we've been, man we've been able to, to build that essentially what other people might call sort of an offshore team. Um, and, uh, and we can grow a global business, you know, out of Indonesia, uh, as we understand both the developing world and the developed world at the same time. Yeah. Thank you, Nigel. And maybe just one last question before we move to the Q and A and I'll ask the speaker after this question to put on their, their videos and mics collectively, but Based on your experience, what would each of you, what would maybe be one or two key pieces of advice for an Australian tech company either looking to enter Indonesia for the first time or scaling their existing presence? Who's going Nigel, to you can go first. You're welcome. Go for it, Nigel. Yeah, cool. Well, I think if it wasn't for COVID, um, which is over now, thankfully, pretty much, um, um, yeah, just come and spend time. Yeah, dedicate you know, um, um, two to three weeks, possibly up to a month if you can, um, you know, and, and just be on the ground, you know, just have lots of, you know, coffees, lots of lunches. Um, um, you don't need to be dedicating all of that time to working in just so essentially work remote. Yeah. Work remote and be on the ground. That'll accelerate the relationship building. Yep. That's my advice. Thanks. Nigel. What about you, Danny? I'll probably add just two, two short ones. Um, one is about, don't be afraid to respectfully challenge the norms um, of what you've been historically told about markets. You know, Indonesia is a, a market which is still maturing, still and, maturing. and understanding their um, their operating rhythms. So I think it's important that we you know, we, we we can provide some guidance on best practice um, and oh, really start to consider and have those detailed discussions with customers. And then finally. Um, my advice would be don't look for customers, search for genuine partners, um, really start looking for um, people who you can build really long term relationships with and someone who's going to really come along the journey with you, um, as opposed to just a, a, a customer, a, a customer relationship, which is, um, you know, partnership is so much more, so much more than that. Excellent advice. Thank you both. Um, that is great advice. And I could, I know we could just keep talking all day. So we might move to the Q&A. I have a few questions coming in on Slido. I, I'll start with Nigel and, and Danny uh, with one of the questions. Um, can you share how you have acquired customers and gained access to the local markets? Um, how do you stand out? Yes, I, um, I, we got in, um, we primarily were exposed to the Indonesian market through, um, we were a participant at one of the large insurers in Australia, their accelerator program in Singapore. Um, as part of that, we were exposed to a number of advisors and consultants um, who provided us information um, about the broader SEA markets and then also introduced us to key people um, at the various different prospects that we had. So, um, 
I've, I found that that was, um, you know, the key for us in terms of being able to enter the market was having that local um, consultant there available for us and then really looking to introduce us to the right level of people and the right type of people for us to have that sort of conversation with. What about you, Nigel? Um, we're a bit unique, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm an ex-headhunter, yeah. So um, mastering the cold approach um, by doing research and paying for a uh, even a small LinkedIn subscription um, to give you um, better search um, is is very, very helpful, yeah. So so that would be my answer, yeah. yeah. But then follow up, build those relationships, Absolutely. all the same things that Danny said, yep, exactly, yep. But a yeah, cold approach doesn't hurt at all, yep. Okay. Um, and moving back to uh, market entry and pathways to the market, I might throw over to our friends at EY and maybe with some additional comments from Pat Is Ixan. Um, what are the entry pathways, um, steps for launching in the Indonesian market? I, I know it probably needs longer than two minutes, but just at a high level. Yeah. Uh, let me take that first and then maybe Pahiri can add on that one. So I, uh, I think uh, understanding of uh, the market, the the customers' uh, behavior. So I like the Nigel statement on a product fit. Yeah. So have your uh, product fit and the right value proposition. Understand what kind of a problem that you are trying to solve in this huge market, huge opportunity. And then I think having a kind of uh, local partners sometimes uh, and and most of the times help really help help you to navigate what Pak Harry mentioned as a quote unquote local wisdom help you uh, maneuver around navigate around in in positive way not not in, in negative way so you can accelerate uh, tapping into their network uh, tapping into their knowledge so that you can you can have your uh, product to the market uh, cycle much faster than than, than the typical uh, one uh, maybe Pak Harry you want to add yeah, I think I think all, all, all good points have been shared already by uh, the friends and the colleagues in the call, right? But uh, I mean, if I try to imagine myself trying to break into the Indonesian market, right? Uh, 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 even though I think the potential is very high in Indonesia, but I think uh, going into Indonesia, given that this is so big, I think you need to have a bit of kind of like calibration internally to have kind of like laser focus as to where you want to start. As uh, Bulonin has mentioned, the, the, the M3 way, right? So when we're talking about where to start, I think you need to kind of like pick your poison a bit, right? Which sector do you want to start with basically, right? Financial services and manufacturing would be totally different kind of set of challenges, different kind of set of players in Indonesia, right? Uh, it's quite diverse actually from the, uh, what would be called pulu to the other, it's actually from the head to toe, right? So uh, that, that's one aspect of it. Second, I think, uh, Try to understand this. I think uh, I forgot to say it. Right? Try to understand the market first, right? Uh, you may have a product. You may have basically a solution, professional services, right? But I think it, it does take a bit of kind of like tuning to understand how it fit into the market. So really picking the right sector, understanding the segment that segment that we are trying to address, right? Talking to the some of the local players, right? To get a flavor. Like when you're talking, about, you get a medical opinion, you get second opinion, third opinion. So you are not basically constrained or misled by just only a single opinion that you hear or all that you have in this in this webinar for example so I, I would i would i would start off uh, with those areas again which sector uh, which solution right again depends on where you're coming from what products and solution you have basically and of course we are happy to actually uh, get connected with you and then uh, see i mean my, my david has uh, eloquently articulated what we have done in terms of mapping and then in coordination in conjunction with the uh, Australian or Victorian government as well. So uh, this is a good start, actually, I think, in my opinion, this webinar. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Bulori. Thank you, Pat Harry. And maybe I know Pat Iksan covered this off a little bit in his remarks about the, the different models, depending on what segment of the market you're in, um, ability to provide digital services um, cross-border, but also the options for setting up a uh, rep office or a PMA in country. So maybe Pat Ixan, do you want to spend one minute uh, talking about that and then I have another question for you? Yeah, um, so I'll uh, just be quick. I think the other speakers have uh, covered, um, um, you know, uh, the, the, the point, um, uh, you know, basically uh, comprehensively. 
Uh, but but maybe maybe from from a legal perspective, uh, don't don't uh, go rushing into the market by setting up a, a, a you know a legal subsidiary, a local subsidiary because it's uh, costly, uh, and uh, it's not easy to um, you know uh, uh, to to di- to dice up the company if you believe that you know the the market is not the best, uh, 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 it's not the best market for for, for your products. Uh, so 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 given the you know the the remoteness of providing uh, uh, digital businesses, you don't need to 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 set up a, an entity. You could always start by you know uh, uh, providing the services remotely from out of the out of the country. And once you feel that uh, there there's uh, traction and then there's a need for uh, onshore operations, then I think by then you can, you can start consider to to uh, set up a, a a local BMA company or. Probably start with uh, setting up a rep, rep, representative office because having a rep office is is less uh, stringent than having a BMA company. Uh, you're not bound to the capital, the minimum capital requirement, and then the other corporate governance and compliance uh, uh, items. But there's other restrictions, but we probably don't have we don't have time to go through all of that today. But one quick question that's come through on the Slido for you, but Iksan is. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk about the independent authority for personal. Uh, the supervisory authority around personal data protection. Any intel in market about where that might land? Yeah, it's uh, the based on the the latest version of the bill. It's clear that it's going to be uh, uh, an organization or an agency within the executive branch. Uh, so this agency will be uh, uh, reporting directly to the president. Uh, so uh, it's unlikely that it's going to be the existing ministries. Uh, we expect uh, it will be a new agency uh, um, within the executive branch uh, will be, uh, you know, dedicated in, in monitoring uh, the implementation of the personal data protection law. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us today as panelists. Uh, your insights are absolutely invaluable. Um, and I think this has definitely been a sprint. We probably needed two hours. Um, But in closing, uh, Austrade and our partners who have joined us here on the call today, we're here to help you um, as you explore the Indonesian market in more detail. And there is definitely more detail. Um, But building on today's discussion and um, Austrade's own reflections on the market, where we see the opportunities for Australian companies in Indonesia include things like cybersecurity, enterprise solutions, in particular banking, financial services, payments, e-commerce, fintech and related services, data centers and related advisory services, digital skills, education and training. And everything we've spoken about today um, are the things driving these opportunities in market. Some of the insights that we see working with our customer network and others have, have touched on this briefly today is Indonesian customers are looking for solutions that will enable product innovation and customer centric data driven personalized services ecosystem integration, scalability and servicing of the underserved, the MSMEs, cloud-based and digital infrastructure solutions, security, both enterprise and transaction. Also touched on by some of our panelists today, I'm going to leave you with three questions when considering the Indonesian market. What problem does your product help solve? Does it make sense in the local context? It's typical that you'll have, it will require localization for the Indonesian market. So be prepared for that. Do you have the right partners in country to optimize your success? And what is your unique selling point? How will your product cut through in a crowded marketplace? Let's go to the next slide. Highlighting here just some upcoming industry events, including the Singapore FinTech Festival in November, which both myself and our business development manager, Nisa, will be on standby to talk about all things Indonesia, support with business matching to Indonesian customers. So in closing, we see enormous potential in the Indonesian tech sector in coming years. And I'm glad we've had the opportunity today to share some of these insights and to hear from several companies on how they've succeeded in the Indonesian market. If you're genuinely looking to expand in Indonesia, my contact details are on this slide. So feel free to reach out to me or our amazing colleagues in the Australia technology team in Australia. And thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. I'll uh, uh, do a quick wrap up. Firstly, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the speakers. Incredible content um, from sort of macro level market opportunities right down to very practical insights of um, executing on the ground. So thank you. Thank you, you know, uh, to all of the speakers for your um, 
time and your content. Thank you to Lauren for um, doing an exceptional job facilitating. Uh, and I'd like to thank again AAA for the partnership that we have to be able to deliver this um, great content to the Australian tech companies. Uh, a quick look forward, the next webinar is, will be on the 8th of November and we'll be highlighting Japan. I think it's our second or third last one. Um, these are all recorded and I think they're posted on the AAA website as also uh, on Australia's website. So if you can't find them, just let us know. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Simon to close proceedings. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks, Lauren and Charlotte from Austrade for organising another fantastic uh, and insightful webinar. It was it was really, really enjoyable. I just love one stat, 133 sm smartphone ownership. I don't know if that's a, a world record in terms of how you got you got more smartphones than people, which is a, which is a great achievement. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, David. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Lauren, for the visual. And I'll see you all on those who are going to join us in on the 8th of November for the Japan webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you.